I love that. You be seated. Good morning, church. Today's Frankie DiOrio's birthday. Good, happy birthday, Frankie. He says, please, please don't tell people. He's 16 and in church. Isn't that great? Praise God. <laughs> All right, look down at Acts chapter 9. Um, years ago was at uh, Lake Elsinore Baptist Church. We were... Um, we, we were just in the church office when the phone rang and a lady said, hey, could some, and this never happens. A uh, lady called and she said, w- could somebody come and tell me how to get saved? And I said, yeah, we'll, we'll be there tomorrow. I don't know why I said it tomorrow, but anyway, we'll be there tomorrow. Uh, that morning, I kind of got together my, my group that was gonna go over there. We were praying and the phone rang again and it was her and she said, hey, I called asking someone to come tell me how to get saved. I need to get saved. So, I mean, when that's kind of the clue. Go, go, stop praying. And remember when, uh, remember when God told Moses, stop praying, get up and part the sea. It's like the Lord said, stop praying, get up and pray with the lady to get saved. So we go over there. Her name was Mary Lee Drees and we prayed with her to get saved. She um, was, she was, oh, wow, into, into drugs. She, was, she and her husband, she says, we have this open marriage. The, her whole life was coming apart, but she had some friends that had come and fallen in love with Jesus. And she said, whatever it is they've got, that's what it is that I need. Well, as we got to know her better, I asked her, well, where is it that you work? Because she'd say, I got to get to work. She worked, I'm not kidding, at Trinity Broadcasting Network. And what she would do, yeah, that's, uh, that's Christian TV. And what she did was she collected money for them. And she said, uh, Mary Lee, how is it that you have all these years worked uh, collecting money for Christian television, but you don't, you know, you didn't know the gospel? And this is what she said. She said, yeah, but there was no resurrection. There, that, 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 which is kind of deep words for a lost person. Am I right? I've never, never heard anybody say that either. Let me show you the resurrection of the Apostle Saul, uh, of the Apostle Paul. This is ph- phenomenal. And, and, and what you find is it's not enough to just claim Jesus, say Jesus, talk about Jesus, sing about Jesus. There has to actually be a resurrection that happens inside of your heart. And you will live, if you've been raised by Jesus, you will live the resurrected life that uh, that no one can mimic, that nobody can uh, can can show in a way other than that you've actually been resurrected. What, one of the things I love about the Bible is it takes you inside these incredible moments, um, and so you are there when Moses parts the sea, more than once, actually. It tells you from different angles. Uh, I, I love it. I love it when Joshua pauses and the sun stands still. Get, let me just, I, I know I'm excited about the text. You haven't read it yet, but I'm excited. Um, know why this is cool? You are actually going to see the salvation of Saul of Tarsus. Isn't that exciting? And this is the guy that, I'll, I'll stop being excited. Here's what's going on. Uh, Saul, write this down. Saul is dead. He is dead to sin. He is lost. He doesn't know he's dead. He thinks he's righteous. Uh, He thinks he's religious, but actually he has a heart that is bent, a heart that is warped. He is at lost at that moment as Judas Iscariot was lost, but God's about to raise him from the dead. Uh, The early church has been preaching. As they preach, they're being persecuted by religious leaders and in particular, by Saul. If you remember, they took Stephen and Stephen preached at his trial, but they stoned Stephen. Paul, uh, Saul, Paul Saul is the one who's holding the coats as they stone Stephen. He, in fact, look down there, uh, just glance up a, a chapter. Look at chapter eight, verse one. What's Saul's opinion of the stoning of Stephen? It says Saul gave, the word there is approval. It means, I think this is a good idea. It's good to stone him. He, he deserves to die. Well, that is rather 
startling. Uh, by the way, as this happens, uh, all this Damascus Road experience, get this. Stephen is dead, but resurrected and standing in heaven. While Saul, or, well, Saul is alive on earth, but he's spiritually dead, about to get it? Uh, Oh, never mind. Just look down there at Acts chapter nine. And no, I'll, I'll stop being excited about this. And then you can be excited. Saul was still breathing threats. This is after uh, all of the, the events of Acts eight, where you had, well, you had Philip in Samaria, you have the Ethiopian eunuch, the church is exploding, but still Saul's doing his stuff. Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Well, what he does is he gets letters from the high priest. What we need to do is not just do Jerusalem. Look, this thing's starting to spread. We got to get to a few other places. You know, I hear there's Christians in Damascus. So let's go to Damascus is the ancient uh, capital of Syria. It is, uh, it, it's, it's a, a large city. He says, we got to go there. Uh, we need to stop because I hear Christianity is growing over there too. And in fact, it is. The Christian community is being led by a guy by the name of Ananias. And he is the leader of the Jesus people in Damascus. Well, Saul's, Saul, by the, Saul's not an ignoramus. Uh, Saul has been trained by Gamaliel in Jerusalem. He says, I can outwit them, I can outsmart them, and if I have to, send me with trained men and I'll kill them. He is committed to eradicating the name of Jesus. You see it? I got to wipe them out. Uh, we, what we did to Stephen, we will do to all of them. Look down there at chapter nine, verse three. What happens as he nears uh, Damascus? You see it? Suddenly, a light. Now, where is the light coming from? It's like when Jesus was baptized and heaven was opened up and the spirit of God came down. Uh, it says this, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Now, let me tell you something cool. Just write down uh, Acts chapter 26, verse 13. And this, this one is important. Saul later, when he tells his own story, says that it was about noontime. Go, why does it matter that it was noontime? When it is noontime and you take a flashlight and you shine that flashlight at noon, noontime, it's really rather unimpressive. Hey, look at this. Yeah, your flashlight's really not cool. At noon. But suddenly there is a light that shines down on Paul, Saul, that is brighter than the light of the sun. That is, there is a light that outshines the sun, suddenly shining into Saul's world, shining into our, our earth is a light bright than material creation. Get it? It is a light brighter than the sun itself. And what he looks up and he will see will blind him and it will change him. He looks up into the glory of the risen Christ. That is, he sees the resurrected glory, the glory that you will see at the coming. He sees what Moses saw. Moses went in there, remember, and when he would leave, his face glowed. God said, all I can show you is the train of my glory. You can't even bear the weight of, uh, of, of who I'm. He, he saw when uh, John stepped into heaven in Revelation chapter one, and he says, I turned and I saw Jesus and his face was shining like the sun. He sees the glory of the living God. Young man was uh, riding with his mom. His mom was, was driving. They were, they were trying to find Montgomery, Alabama, but they had gotten lost on the freeway system. He was inebriated in the back and she was trying, trying, trying to find it. And eventually as they went system, and she, she topped a hill and saw the, um, saw the signs of a radio station there in uh, Montgomery. And she said, oh, we're gonna be okay. I saw the light. The young man, you might wanna guess the name, was Hank Williams and he wrote a song. What, we, what was the song? You remember the song? Is I saw the light and it went kind of like this. He said, I wandered so aimless, my life full of sin. I would not let my dear savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord. What'd he say? I saw the light. Well, Saul, he does not start singing. What's he do? Falls to the ground. And now the light starts speaking to him. Out of that comes a voice. It says this, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who, who are you? I like it that he says, who are you, Lord? Like, I, I know, only God can do this. I have no idea who you are, but who are you, Lord? Here's the answer, I am Jesus. Oh, whoa, 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 you thought I was dead? I stand in glorious light. I am Jesus who you are persecuting. 
Um, this is the last of the physical resurrection appearances, and it counts as a resurrection appearance. It is as real as, um, as Peter uh, seeing Jesus, as John seeing Jesus, as those women at the tomb. So remember all of those? Remember that, that resurrection morning? The women come to the tomb and they see Jesus. That night, the disciples see Jesus. And then for 40 days, they see Jesus. They see him on the shore. They see him. And we count those as resurrection appearances. We say for 40 days, Jesus appeared and then he ascended. And then there was one more. The apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I was like one abnormally born. And what he means is, I saw the resurrected Christ, not in a vision. What's, let me be very clear. What's happening here is not a vision. He is actually visually seeing the physical resurrected Jesus Christ. You go, how do you know? Because in a moment he's about to be blind and just to clue you in, visions don't blind you. Something actually physical happens. He sees the physical presence of the living God. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul uh, is suddenly blind, can't see. What you're gonna see next, if he's dead, write this down, not only is Saul dead, you're gonna see the resurrection of Saul. Jesus is already raised, he is gonna do the work of resurrecting Saul. Um, what Jesus did throughout his ministry was there were these little moments where he would show us that he has power over death itself. And he would, they'd come, they'd bring him somebody, they'd go to Jairus and he would, remember that? He would raise Jairus' daughter from the, uh, the dead. He would, uh, remember when he stands outside of Lazarus' tomb? You do. And he said, what? Lazarus, come forth. What is he doing at that moment? Well, he's not just raising the dead. He's showing us that he has the living power over death. Somebody has to be able to crush death. So, um, in fact, he, he did it himself. We, the third day, he rose again. Look down there at chapter 9, verse 10. Now you're going to see a conversation between Jesus and the leader of the Jesus people, Ananias, about Saul. There is a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, the, the leader of the church there. The Lord said to him in a vision. I love how specific, look down there at the words, the Lord is. The Lord says, Ananias, there, there's a house on Straight Street. Um, there's a man there. He's at a vision. He saw somebody come and lay hands on them and pray. And he's there and he's praying. Don't you love how specific Jesus is? He knows where you live. He knows what your address is. He knows what you, what you drive. And he's not impressed, by the way. Um, What's Ananias? He says, I want you to go to him. I love the way Ananias begins to school Jesus. He says, Lord, that's a really bad idea. You don't want me to go there. Has God ever had a bad, don't laugh too hard at Ananias. You've had a, you've had a couple moments also where you thought, Lord, that's a really bad idea. Don't send me to 29 Palms. I got a better idea. Don't keep me, don't, anyway. <laughs> look down here. Uh, Ananias says, look, this guy's dangerous. He is coming here with orders to kill actually us. So I'm actually the worst one to send. Look what Jesus says in verse 15. Oh, okay. Thanks for the info, Ananias. What does he say? You, hey, you're not in charge of this. I am he says, go. I wasn't looking for your opinions and I wasn't looking for a committee. He is my chosen, he is the chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. Hey, Ananias, it is, it is a sudden moment when the Lord looks at his servant and he says, I will run my kingdom the way I want to because this is a kingdom, not a democracy. And then look at verse 16. What's he say? I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. Oh, oh, that's startling. He is going to endure riots. He will be lied about. He's thrown in prison. He will be stoned the old fashioned way. He's going to be shipwrecked. It is going to be rough. Look at verse 17. Don't you love living in Marine Town? I love that. Amen. Ananias goes on foot, not helicopter. Look down here and laying his hands on him. Now, here's this incredible moment. This is as great as the walls of Jericho. This is as great as the sun standing still. This is one of those moments in your Bible. It fills me with joy. Laying his hands on them, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me to you to regain your sight. It is like 
Saul is coming out of a tomb and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You were dead. You were dead to sin and to trespass and to hate, and now you are about to be alive by the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. The physical um, blindness is taken, but also spiritual blindness. Suddenly his spiritual eyes are opened. Then he rose and he was, what is he, what happens to him? Baptizo, he is baptized, he is immersed. I love verse 19, hold on, don't look at it yet. Let me clue you in on something. Every time they do a resurrection, I'm not kidding, just go check this through the Bible. Every time they do a resurrection, they feed the person. You Apparently getting raised from the dead makes you phenomenally hungry, I can't explain that. It's probably when you die and you get to heaven, you eat because you've been raised from the dead, but they're always eating. I'm not kidding, what happens? Saul gets up and what do they do? They feed him. Um, he's also been fasting for it. But I just thought that was cool. This is to me one of those, well, can I just show you how cool this is? Can I, you ever just stand back in your Bible and go, wow, wow. Let me just show you some of the wows that are there. Uh, write this down. Number one, that's just an awesome passage because you actually see Saul of Tarsus filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the moment in your Bible that the Spirit enters Saul of Tarsus. And suddenly, this man who was dead to God and his mind was dead to God and his ways were dead to God, he is suddenly filled with the Spirit of God. Hold on, hold on, here's why this is cool. That Holy Spirit that steps into Saul is going to inspire him to write the book of Galatians. It's going, the Spirit of God is going to inspire him. Look, the author of Romans just entered the one that by his fingers would pen the book of Romans. You all, um, you're like, we're not that thankful for it. You, you get married? You read, you read this guy's words probably at your wedding. Love is patient, love is kind. Love. Remember all that? This is the moment that um, what we believe is not that Paul wrote Romans. Romans was above Paul, but that God spoke to him and he pinned what God said. That's a moment when, uh, when the Spirit of God enters him. It's not just that. Notice this also, you then see the baptism of Saul. This is the, the actual, uh, Ananias takes him, baptizes him. That is, Saul would declare, I was dead and now I am alive to be taken down into the waters to symbolize the death of Jesus Christ and to be taken up. By the way, if Saul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul needs to be baptized, you, am I right? They're probably, it's not like you're like, well, I'm better than that. I don't really need that water baptism stuff. Paul would say this, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. The old is dead, buried, gone, and the new has come. Um, just another, an, another wow in that. You, you not only get to see the Spirit of God entering Saul, and then you see his baptism. I just thought it was really cool that at that moment, you, uh, you also see the first sermon of the Apostle Paul. Look down there at verses 20 and 21. You remember... Um, you ever heard a first sermon? Were you impressed? Uh, did, were you like, why? Well, probably not. Immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues that he is the son of God. And everyone who heard him was, well, keep preaching, son. You're gonna get better. It's gonna be okay. You're, no, everyone who heard him was amazed. They say, isn't he the one that was causing havoc in Jerusalem. By the way, where he goes to preach his first sermon takes a little bit of, usually you kind of want to preach your first sermon in some friendly territory. Am I right? Uh, hey, come on a Sunday night. We'll let you preach. Everybody will tell you you good. We'll line up the old ladies. They'll pat you on the back, tell you you're a good preacher. Boy, you preach about 15, 20 times and maybe we'll let you go somewhere else. But right now, just kind of stay close to home. Then he goes, he says, I've got to go right now. This takes guts. This is boldness. He says, I'm going back to the synagogue. Get this. These are the people that, 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 that are rooting for the death of the Christians, he goes back and what he says is we were wrong. This one that we wanted to destroy the name of, he's actually alive, he's raised from the dead and we should be following him. Not a bad first sermon. Well, get this, what God did in Saul, God wants to do in you. He wants to raise us from the dead. He, uh, can I just put it this way? He still raises the dead. Still raises the dead. He still takes people from death 
into life. And I just, I don't know, I got about 20, but I'll give you four. Um, what happens when the Holy Spirit raises us from the dead? Let me just pull these out of this text. But I'll tell you what it looks like when you are no longer living for you, but you are living the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus would heal that girl in Nain or that boy in Nain. He would heal Jairus' daughter, raise him from the dead. He'd raise Lazarus. He still does this stuff. Write this down. When, when the Holy Spirit raises us like he did Saul, number one, my love for myself, what happens to it? It's suddenly quieted. All through life when you're not saved, it's, in fact, you were born this way. Smile. Me, 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 me me, you are very important to you. Um, and we kind of feel like, I, I'm pretty good. In fact, I fight for righteous causes. I do good things. I deserve the salvation. I, I, I'm good at, like, you kind of think, how, how are you going to get into heaven? Well, look, when I get there, God's going to be very impressed with me read this, uh, this is Michael, remember Michael Bloomberg? He was the mayor of New York for years. Read an interview with him. This is New York Times. <laughs> I love this. He was getting ready for, he was 72 at the time, getting ready for his 50th college reunion. I'll just read you, this is um, out of the New York Times. But if Bloomberg senses that he may not have much time left, as he'd like, he has little doubt about what would await him on Judgment Day. Now listen, pointing to his work on gun safety, obesity, and smoking cessation, I guess that gets you into heaven. That's, he said with a grin, I'm telling you, if there's a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. Whoa, if you kind of pause there and go, whoa, 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 hold on, Michael, that is not the gospel. That is our self being loud about ourself. That's, in fact, not only is that not the gospel, hear me, church, that is ungospel. That is anti-gospel. That is anti-Christ. That is not of God. That is of the flesh. That is mankind going, me, me, look how loud I am. Look how strong I am. Look how much I have done. Saul says, I will do righteous things. I will persecute these Christians. And he's all about himself until he hears the word, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You're not helping me, you're torturing me. You're causing pain. When you're lost, you're hungry. You're hungry for the flesh, for the carnal nature. Am I right? You're just hungry. And you're filled with a passion to, to fill those lusts, uh, to fill your life with whether it is sex or to gratify the sinful nature. Now listen to me. When you are raised into the new life of Jesus Christ, you're still hungry, but you're given a new hunger. And no longer are you hungry for the things of the flesh. Those things are supposed to die. And just like there's a greater light than the light of the sun, there becomes a hunger that is greater than the hunger of the flesh. And that is the hunger that you have for Jesus Christ. That he burns, am I right? And suddenly what you're hungry for, gentlemen, is not just sex and flesh. That is overpowered and overcome and outflamed by a hunger for God's righteousness. A hunger and an appetite for holiness a hunger and an appetite for godly. And it's not just for godliness. It's not just that you, you want to please him. Suddenly you want to be like him. Um, and he just gives you peace with that. Um, you, you change so much when you get saved. Your old friends are like, what happened to you? Am I right? Have you had that happen? They're like, how, did, how come you change so much? Well, not only do uh, your old Old loves die out, and your love for yourself is quieted when you find that resurrection. But number two, the Holy Spirit gives you, and he raises you up, a passion and a love for Jesus Christ. He stirs in you a love that no one else can give him. Saul goes from, we've got to kill the followers of Jesus, to suddenly he's in love with Jesus. You see it? He loves Jesus. So look down there at verse 16. This is phenomenal to me. I will show him, Jesus says, how much he must. What's the word there? Profit, gain, suffer for my name. 
Here's the truth, guys. You suffer for what you love. You guys would say, I will suffer for, I'll, I'll suffer for my wife, my kids, suffer for my nation. You suffer for what you love. He says, he's gonna love me so much, he's gonna be willing to die for me. Uh, Philippians chapter one, verse 29, that's lived out. It's, that, it's almost like Jesus speaks prophetically. He's gonna be so in love with me, he's gonna be ready to die for me. Paul said in Philippians 1, 29, it has been granted me the privilege to suffer for Jesus. Can you imagine? Very almost verbatim, the words Jesus had said about him, I'm gonna give him this. And then Paul says, we go, oh, Paul, we're so sorry that you had to suffer. And Paul would say, are you kidding me? The greatest privilege of my life is that I get to suffer for Jesus because I love him so much. Um, isn't it true that when you, when you fall in love with Jesus, suddenly, suddenly you can't stop talking about him everywhere. Yeah, he goes back to the synagogue of all places. Everywhere you go, you ever meet a young Christian and they're new in their faith and they don't know they're supposed to keep this thing a secret? And you, everywhere you take them, they're like, I gotta tell you about it, just stay quiet. They're in the grocery store telling people are getting saved. Don't you love young, any of you just love young believers? Because, uh, hey, you get a young believer that's on fire for Jesus. Am I right? You love it. What I have to do with Saul, he's, he's so on fire for Jesus, they have to sneak him out of the city. Look down there at, um, uh, 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 where, where is this? They, uh, verses 23 to 25. They sneak him out of the city in a basket because he's so loud and passionate about Jesus. Now let me tell you something about passion. Passion starts in the seat of the emotion. God stirs your emotions, but it cannot remain there. Eventually, it will flame out. It has to settle eventually into the bedrock of what we call conviction. But sometimes you find people who have conviction and they're just annoying because they don't have any passion. So I would say this. A right passion for Jesus Christ is conviction with hot sauce. You only hear it here, Paul's Baptist. It is, but hey, here's what I mean by that. No, no silliness, listen. It is not just being on fire for Jesus. Passion for Jesus is the denial of the self. That I love, as, man, I'm on fire. Did you deny yourself? Do you walk with him? Uh, are you ready to give up your reputation for him to be energized? It, that's what it is. I, I die and I am now energized by the power of the risen Jesus. And he gets me up every day. Um, and suddenly your opinions change. No longer are you guided by yourself. Pe people will say to you, man, you're so narrow-minded now. Oh yeah, I'm narrow-minded. I'm on a narrow road. That's why. Amen. Isn't it quiet in here? You know, like, um, baptized people. Ever notice what we ask them? You believe that Jesus is the son of God. We go through the confession of faith. They say yes. And we ask them, have you made a commitment to Jesus? Yes. I always end with this. Will you live for him? Yes. And we ask this. A lot, of you in the, a lot of you in this room were baptized here. We asked you this, didn't we? Will you what, guys? Will you suffer for him? Because what I say is, hey, Christianity's gotten marketed really well, but nobody told you that you might have to love him so much and be so full of passion that you would suffer for him. There's a passion that only Jesus can give you. Notice down, down there again at verse 16. Ananias, go show him how much he must suffer for it. No, 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 no. Ananias, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Um, you can't change, here, here's great news. You can't change anybody's heart, but God can. Jesus can. You can't set anybody, you can't get them fired up. Hey, you can't, you can't get people fired up for Jesus. Am I right? You can't control the weather. If you could, anyway. You can't control who wins the Super Bowl. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You can't control the lights in Yucca Valley. What makes you think you can, amen. John Baines was a Marine out here, um, lost, arguing with his wife all the time, drinking, driving up Adobe Road, this is in the 1980s, and he, as he would drink, he said, the way I showed respect to God is I put my beer down as I drove by the church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. One day, I think it's a Sunday night, he drove into church, came inside, heard the message of the gospel from the preacher. So was it you? No, I was like, I don't know, five. But um, goes in there, 
he hears the message of the gospel and he gets saved. And there's suddenly tension in his marriage. His wife is mad. She left him. Uh, he's got, but God put a call on John's life. This, this guy was from Mississippi. Uneducated, he said, God would never use me. Well, the church took him and started discipling him. And he said, I don't understand this, but I think I've got a call to ministry. And God called John into ministry and he started uh, preaching the gospel. And pretty soon the pastor there, uh, the pastor here, his name is Mike Proctor, went to start a church in Alaska. First, we sent him down to Morongo, started a church out there. John, go down there and preach in Morongo. Then the pastor took him up to Alaska preaching in Alaska, and then they did a mission trip, and they went to Australia, and they're out there, and they're preaching. You know what the Aborigine are? Uh, they're out there, and they're preaching to the Aborigine, and the missions team is getting ready to go home, and the Aborigine say to our mission team, you all come and you preach the gospel, but nobody stays and disciples us. And John Bain said, from 29 Palms, California, I will stay, and I'll disciple you got credentialed by the International Mission Board, and he stayed for his lifetime discipling the Aborigine from, tw from 29 Palms. Let, let me ask you this. Where did that fire come from? You think we gave that to him? Like, John, you gotta have this fire. Hear me, if we gave him that fire, it would have burned out in Morongo. There's gotta be a fire that burns in you that's not from any man, but it comes from Jesus Christ. Listen, here's what the, the resurrection does, is not only does it quiet you about yourself and it gives you a fresh passion for Jesus, but he, Jesus is gonna show you when he raises you up the beauty of the church. Look down there, verse 26. I love this. He comes back to Jerusalem. It says, he attempted to join the disciples. That's the church. So he went from, I hate church, to I gotta be there. I gotta be at church. This is funny. Am I allowed to show you funny stuff in the Bible? <laughs> they were all afraid of him. They kicked him out of starting point. You can't come here. Look, look everybody's welcome, actually, except you. You, you can't come here. We, we made a church rule. We had a business meeting. We talked about it. We don't want you coming to church here. But everybody else is welcome. Um, send, you got any friends? Send them. They kicked him out. That, that is, they did not believe he was a disciple. He's like, I've got my baptism certificate, but not suitable for, I mean, suitable for framing, but not yet framed. I've got my baptism certificate from Ananias. They say, no, 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 no. Look, man, we saw the tweets. We saw you on YouTube holding the, the coats of the people that murdered Stephen. We saw you slap Chris Rock. I mean, we know what you did. We're, we don't believe it. Look at verse 27. I love this, Barnabas. What does Barnabas do? You see it, Barnabas brings him to the apostles and he tells them that he saw the Lord and that he's been preaching Jesus and they take him in. Aren't you glad for the Barnabases in the church? And look what happens in the church at verse 31. The church had peace and was built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it what? More and more people are like, we gotta be part of this. What is the comfort of the Holy Spirit? It is that they could feel among their presence, the presence of God. Um, people say, I don't go to church because you know, I had a bad experience one time at church. Saul was like the bad experience generator. And there he was. Notice it says that they walk in the fear of the Lord. Can, can I tell you what it means when it says they walked in the fear of the Lord? There was a deep sense that Jesus actually had raised from the dead and that it was his church, not theirs. And uh, the, the danger of church today is that we're far enough from the resurrection is we start thinking the church belongs to us when actually it belongs to Christ. Uh, that it, hey, it is not my church. People say, you know, uh, well, what do you, what do you teach? Or what do, we're supposed to only be teaching what Jesus gives us because he's the head of the, um, I do not get to decide, this can startle you. I, I and we do not get to decide what we believe, otherwise we'd believe different stuff than we believe. That right? If we had to vote in a committee, what do you guys wanna believe? Actually wanna believe some different stuff than we do believe what we believe, we believe because it's true. Smile, I can't say it again, but you get it, right? We don't decide what we preach. We don't decide our doctrine. Uh, we ordain a guy to ministry. Remember what we do? Do the same thing for deacons. We just don't lay hands on them. We take a big, heavy chain and we put it around their neck and we say this, 
We are setting you aside to preach the gospel, not to preach what you want to preach, but you are the slave of someone else. And in front of everybody, we lay a chain over them to remind them that we are slaves of Jesus Christ. Can I describe the church this way? What the church is that you suddenly fall in love with is the church is the resurrected people of Jesus. It's, like, it's supposed to be like heaven on earth, that we come together here and we experience Jesus. Am I right? Remember what um, Jesus would say? He gets his disciples together and he says, who, who do men say that I am? They say, well, some say you're John the Baptist and some say that you're one of the prophets. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter filled at that moment. I, I, this did not come from his head. It's like, um, did you ever see that Twilight Zone where the guy can hit a stopwatch and it pauses time? It's like the Holy Spirit hit a stopwatch, paused time, opened Peter's mouth, put the words in and started again. But uh, Peter looks and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, and Jesus says what? Blessed are you, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Petros, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. It's mine, Peter. It belongs to me. Um, the 24 seven work of Jesus right now around the world is Jesus is building his church. And it is the highest honor in the world when Jesus invites us to be part of what it is that he's doing. And what is it he says? He then says, and Peter, the gates of hell will not overcome you. Tell, you. tell you a secret here. Gates don't march. The idea of Jesus is not that hell's gonna be attacking us and we're putting up some kind of grand defense. The idea of the gospel is that we are making it, that we are bringing destruction to hell with the living life. That is, gates don't march, but resurrected people do. And we carry the gospel. Um, last thing. Of the 20, I was gonna tell you. Just write this down. Suddenly, my future changes. And when I've been resurrected, my future is focused on his will for me, not my will for myself. And no longer is it, what do I want, what do I want? Because I've been quieted, right? And I'm now very focused on what does he want? Not my dreams, not my goals. Lord, what do you want? Look down there at 915. God tells Ananias, he is my chosen instrument. He weird, God chooses weird people. Choose Rahab, choose um, Ehud, choose Gideon, chose you. Am I right? Does it blow you away that in this room are the disciples of Jesus and we don't always feel that great about us or one another and yet you've been raised from the dead and you are the ones that God's gonna use to change this generation? Um, he is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Dear Ananias, before you count him out, before you cancel him, before you throw him away, understand I have big ministry assignments for him. Jesus chooses people we would so quickly count out, doesn't he? Um, this guy that Ananias says, you don't want him, he would write 13 books of your New Testament. He, he would write, four, he, or he would start 14 or more churches. And people say, Man, I'm kind of scared. I just don't know if I want to follow Jesus. And the attitude, people are sometimes scared to say this out loud to me, but the feeling is kind of this. Well, I don't know if I want to follow Jesus because you know, what if Jesus is kind of boring and I don't want to live a boring life. Um, remember that time that Paul was in Philippi and that demon-possessed girl kept yelling at him and he drove out the demon, got thrown in prison, and an earthquake set him free? Remember that? Remember, uh, remember when he was in Lystra and uh, he healed that lame guy and then they said he must be a god? Remember, remember that? And then they stoned him. Remember that time he got shipwrecked and he was on that island and um, I think it was Malta and a snake came out and bit him and they thought he was gonna die and he shook the snake off and he didn't die. He said, he must be, remember that? Hey, hear me. You might, get, you, you might get bit by snakes, you might get attacked by demons, but following Jesus, you won't be bored, I promise you. Um, yeah, just uh, come on up, praise him. Let me close with some, let, let me just ask you some questions as you just pray about God. What, what do you want me doing? Can, can I ask you to ask God for some things? Would you ask God, maybe at this altar, would you give me a fresh fire in my heart? And let me just ask you this, as your pastor, my, my heart to yours. When was the last time that you really felt holy zeal 
not just that you were kind of on fire for Jesus, but that, but you had conviction with hot sauce, that um, that the spirit that that God burned in you with joy. Um, you even need to come and say this to God, God, I need less of myself. Now, I'm not telling God that. You'll be great if you do. You'll be great if you do. Some of you are poking your spouse like, that's it, that's the one, go pray. It's gotta, gotta be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Have you ever just given God permission to show you the places you're in love with you that you really think you're great? Um, have you ever told God, God, I wanna be used for your purposes? I wanna be used for you. The greatest privilege in life is when Jesus taps you on the shoulder and says, come, follow me. I've got work for you to do. Now listen to me. Some of you are allowing past sins to impede you from serving God right now. Um, I want you to ask him that you not, look, his forgiveness is there, but I would ask you, maybe you need to come and say, God, I need to not just know your forgiveness theologically, I need to feel your forgiveness so I can serve you again. That I no longer be defined by the fact that I was part of stoning Stephen, but I now be defined by the blood of Jesus, by his adoption, by his propitiation. Um, Those early steps you take in faith, they're wow moments. And some of you need to start with some of those early steps. Thank you for listening to the sermon. For further information or to get in contact with our church's ministries, please visit us at palmsbaptistchurch.com.